Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Chris, I'm a recovered alcoholic. My sobriety date is December 2nd, 2007. My home group is the living room group in Dorchester, uh, which is a small part of Boston. And uh, we meet on Tuesday nights from um, 7 o'clock to 8.15. It's a uh, big book-based meeting. Um, we read out of the big book and we discuss about the, uh, <clears throat> we discuss about the literature. And, uh, you know, it's an unbelievable meeting. On Wednesday night, we have an all-women's meeting. Um, same format. And then on Friday nights, uh, we have a co-ed meeting. And uh, it's a speaker meeting. <clears throat> um, nevertheless... Um, like I said, my sobriety date is December 2nd, 2007, and I've stayed sober, um, through good sponsorship, a loving God, and a dedication to this way of life. Um, I thought me getting sober was something that was going to be impossible. Um, I honestly and truthfully thought that I was going to die an alcoholic and an addict. Um, not only did I feel as though that I was hopeless, but I felt as though that I was helpless, um, in the end. But um, I picked up a drink at the age of 16, and um, man, I could tell you, um, it was one of the most profound days of my life, um, and honestly, on that night, um, man, something happened to me, I'm not quite sure what it was, but the magic of alcohol happened in my life, and uh, man, I could tell you, I liked myself better when I was when I had alcohol and drugs in my system. Um, you know, after about the second or third one, every pain, every pressure, every fear, every doubt, every insecurity that I had, it just seemed to go away. It was magic what I found in that bottle. It was, it, it was amazing. And like I said, it was probably one of the most profound nights of my life. Um, <clears throat> something that I didn't know that was going on um, was that, that I was an alcoholic. And I had no idea. I didn't even know what it meant, what it really meant to be an alcoholic. Um, and the other thing, too, was that I, I made a decision on that night, and I really didn't realize that I was making it. And that was to make alcohol and drugs the most important thing in my life. And to make it the most important thing in my life, I was going to pay a lot of prices along the way. And I really didn't realize that I was doing this and that, you know, drugs and alcohol were making, you know, were making decisions for me that I thought I was making on my own. Um, <clears throat> but what happens to a guy like me when I pick up a drink is it becomes paramount to everything in my life. And I don't want to call it that, but that's exactly what it is. If you look at my actions throughout the course of my, my drinking and my drug addiction, that's exactly what it was. Um, and I really had good intentions and I didn't want to hurt anybody. Um, but like I said, the drink, it just became paramount to everything in my life. Um, and, and, and I would pay a lot of prices along the way to, to, to make it the most important thing in my life. And if you got you know, in the way of, of my drinking or my drug addiction, I would have to, I would have to remove you from my life in some way, somehow. Um, and, you know, some of the prices that I paid um, was my driver's license to begin with. Um, then it was some friends. Then it was some girlfriends. And it was my family, place to live, um, my career, my freedom. Um, and in the end, my will to live. And I don't know if any of you guys can identify with that, man, but it just, it, it did. It became paramount to everything. And I didn't want to hurt anyone in my life. And, and I didn't want to ruin these relationships with these girlfriends. And, and I didn't want to get fired from my job. And I didn't want to sleep outside. And I didn't want to go to jail. And I didn't want to hurt my parents. And, like, I didn't want to do any of these things that I was doing. Uh, but there was nothing I could do on my own power to not do what I didn't want to do, and I couldn't understand why. And honestly, like, deep down inside, I did not want to live the way that I was living and do the things that I was doing and hurting the people that I was hurting. But there was nothing I could do on my own power to stop this. It, 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 and I, I didn't understand why I continue to do these things. See, in the big book, it gives, like, this unbelievable description about how the alcoholic is like the... Uh, is like the guy who, who keeps putting his hand on the hot stove, you know, 
And, and like I asked the guy recently, would you put your hand on a hot stove? And he said, no. I said, why not? He goes, because it would hurt and it would burn me. Right? The guy has a mental defense against putting his hand on a hot stove. But for some reason, you replace that hot stove with alcohol and drugs. And, and, and man, alcohol and drugs burnt my life to the ground probably three times over and left me homeless and, and, and just, I don't know, the scorecard read zero. But for some reason, I would go back to alcohol and drugs and it would burn me once again. See, the deal is, is that, uh, you know, <clears throat> I have no mental defense against certain times against alcohol and drugs. And um, regardless, some of those uh, consequences that I were um, that I were paying really didn't come quickly. You know, I would probably say between the ages of 16 and 20, you know, um, drugs and alcohol was something I was trying to sprinkle around my life. But between the ages of 20 and 25, life was something I was trying to sprinkle around drugs and alcohol. And it just wasn't working anymore. And the drink and the drug was really starting to catch up, you know. And I started to pay some of these consequences that I didn't want to pay. And, um... I'll tell you right now, like I pointed the finger at you, at my family, at my girlfriends, at my at my coworkers, at my employees, and, and at the police. I pointed the finger at everyone else in my life, and I and I really didn't want to be accountable for the action that I was taking in my life. Um, I grew up in this home, and uh, you know, I, I guess when I was a young kid, um, I don't really remember much, but um, things seemed to be fine. But there was a point in time where. Things got real ugly in my life as a young child. Um, there was a lot of abuse in my home, um, verbal and, and mostly physical. And, uh, you know, there would be a time where I was living in this home that was infested with drugs. Um, you know, the abuse was, was horrific, and it was day after day, month after month, year after year. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, when my father left when I was around eight years old, he was uh he was like living this life that really didn't include a family at the time. He was an illegal entrepreneur and uh you know and, and it was something that he couldn't just walk away from and uh you know he um he ended up moving to a to a different part of Massachusetts and uh and I was left behind with my mother and my sister and my brother and my oldest brother who uh who was my biggest mentor in my life growing up moved away with him and I was living in this home with my sister, my mother, and my brother. And uh, my sister was 14 years old. My brother was 18. And uh, my mother, my sister, and my brother were smoking crack together on a daily basis. And I was living in this home. And, uh, man, it, it was, uh, I don't know. You know, it was just like, I can remember when I was that young, I, I was just like, uh, I wished I'd never been born. I hated it. My, my house was, like, infested with flies and, and can, always dirty, never had clean clothes. And, like, you know. Uh, my father would show up here and there, and, uh, man, I, I remember as a young kid growing up, like, I just, uh, I don't know, I, I came to that point where I was like, if there's a God and he really exists, you know, I, I really, uh, I'm all set, you know, and, 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 and I can remember at that point in time, I had lost my love for you and my family, and I had lost my love for God, and, uh, honestly, I was going to show you what I thought about this so-called life, and, um, <clears throat> after um after a few years of living in that um I went and lived with my father and it was just like you know one bad situation to the next and uh you know the abuse would continue um his girlfriend was an alcoholic and uh you know but I thought that my life was moving in the right direction at least I was like out of that situation that I was in and uh you know I was I was starting to do like a little bit better in school and I I really excelled well in sports like you know, and, and uh, you know, I had some pretty high hopes for myself. You know, I, I was um, when, when I was, you know, between the ages of like 12 and 16, I I, I was um, I uh, I fought. I was an amateur, and and uh, and, and I, I I you know I did incredible. You know, I, I really did. I did really well, and I was ranked number three in the nation. And like I had this like you know this big hope and, and dream that like I was going to become a professional fighter. And I also did just as well in baseball. And uh. But man, I, I hit that age of 16 and I picked up a drink and something happens, you know. Um, something happened that it, it was probably, like I said, I don't know, it was just the most profound moment in my life, you know what I mean? It was just like, you, you know, you ever like, wait, have you ever like relapsed before and you pick up that first one, you're just like, 
<sighs> Thank God. Thank God. You know what I mean? Because you're so restless, irritable, and discontent, and suicidal, and homicidal. You know what I mean? It's like someone's going to get hurt or I need a drink. You know? And that's basically, you know, like I held off for as many years as I could. And finally at 16, like, I got that experience. And, um, but like I said, I, um, I came to that point now, though, where just like, uh, the scorecard read zero. You know, um, I was no longer welcome in my home. I was no longer welcome in many of my friends' homes anymore. Um, I, uh, I, I had burnt every bridge there was to burn. And, uh, I was living in and out of programs. Sometimes I was sleeping outside. Sometimes I was sleeping in abandoned cars. And, uh, I was running around different parts of Boston and, and uh, you know, um, this is Alcoholics Anonymous, but my story is my story, and, and uh, you know, um, in the end, you know what I mean, like, I, I was I was just a dope fiend, crackhead, dope fiend, alcoholic, that would pretty much do anything that I could uh, to get high, and, um, you know, I, I was experiencing that bitter end of, uh, of alcoholism, you know, I was experiencing that bitter end, and uh, I couldn't imagine living life with drugs and alcohol or without them. You know, and the big book says that we'll come to that place, that place, you know what I mean, that jumping off place, and we'll feel loneliness that few will ever feel. And uh, I can remember feeling that way. Um, and uh, it was ugly. I just couldn't take my life being sober, and I couldn't take it while I was drinking. You know, but in the beginning, it was a lot of fun, and, 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 and it worked, you know, and it was good. Um, but finally, what happened for me is, um, you know, my father, who was still alive at this time, um, you know, I went and I asked him for help and, um, you know, I went to this detox and, you know, I, I'm just in this detox and, and I'm pointing the finger, like, again, you know, I'm the victim, you know, I'm the victim and I'm not holding myself accountable for any of the actions I took. It was the upbringing that I had. I thought that's what made me an alcoholic. My brother, my oldest brother that went and left with my father, he ended up getting murdered. My father would end up dying, um, who in the end was probably my best friend. Um, and, and, and man, I, I was just like, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, I, uh, I thought some of these outside circumstances were what made me an alcoholic. Today I know that it has nothing to do with my outside circumstances and has everything to do with my internal condition of mind and body. Um, I've met quite a few people in Alcoholics Anonymous who come from nice families and nice homes and they're just as alcoholic as I am. It has nothing to do with the outside circumstances. It has everything to do with this internal condition of mind and body. That's something that makes me different from the average drinker. Like my girlfriend, she's not an alcoholic. She drinks like, you know, she drinks like a few times a year when she has like a couple of drinks. And like she won't maybe even leave half a glass and she won't think about it. I'll think about it. You know what I mean? I'm like looking at her. What is she doing? You know, she's walking away. Um, insane, you know. Um, but, uh. I remember being in that detox, and uh, I'm just like, you know, I, I really, I honestly wanted to change. I wanted to change, and um, I was sick of living my life the way I was living, and uh, I wanted to stay sober. Um, and I'll tell you right now, I remember the day I was going home, and I'm set up with all this, like, aftercare stuff, and uh, you could have hooked me up to a lie detector test. I was going to stay sober, um, guarantee that, and um, within a few hours of leaving that detox, I was high again, and uh, I can remember sitting there, just like, uh, you know, how, how did this happen, you know, it was just a few hours ago that I had actually sworn off drugs and alcohol for the rest of my life, and within a few hours, um, I was drunk and high again, right, um, I didn't know about the mental obsession, um, I didn't understand it. I didn't know what it was about. Um, but for the next three years of my life, that's how it would be. I would bounce in and out of programs and out of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you know, being homeless or, or, or being in jail or, um, you know, trying to be sober, uh, hanging on to my seat and shooting for midnight, uh, really just wanting to, like, strangle somebody, um, because I'm that guy that talks about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm, I'm restless, irritable, discontent, sober. Drugs and alcohol are my solution. They were my solution to this so-called life. And um, I don't know, I, for the next three years, I would come in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I would come to Alcoholics Anonymous to find relief 
from drugs and alcohol. And after every short, brief period, time of sobriety, I would pick up a drink or a drug to get relief from my sobriety and my inability to live comfortably in it. Um, you know, I, I just, um, you know, I, I'm that guy that it talks about in the big book. You know, it says that drugs and alcohol are but a symptom, you know, that the root of my problems was selfishness and self-centeredness driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, and self-pity, and self-seeking motives. Now, when, like, that was first told me, I was, like, looking at my sponsor, like, what is this guy talking about? You know what I mean? I think like you just, you know, everyone's telling me that I have a problem with drugs and alcohol. And I figure that if I just take the drink and the drug out of the equation, my problem solved. You know what I mean? No harm, no foul. I'm going to go on with my life now. Um, and, and that wasn't the case. Um, you take a drink or a drug away from a guy like me who didn't just solve my problem. My problems have just begun because I don't know how to live without them. Right? And I have a huge inability to live comfortably in this life without a drink or without a drug. And, uh, I mean, I remember when I read that doctor's opinion for the first time, and it was talking about being, like, restless, irritable, and discontent, unless I can again gain that sense of ease and comfort, which comes out once by taking a few drinks. You know, I, I was reading this with my sponsor, and I'm like, it just, he made this book come to life for me. It, it was incredible. And uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at my sponsor, and I, like, smiled, you know? And it was just like, I finally thought I found, like, some, some hope. You know, which is the greatest gift that one alcoholic can give to another is hope. And um, I can tell you right now, I remember being sober for eight and a half months. And uh, I was in a sober house and I was going to meetings every day, sometimes two. Um, I had a job. I was in a relationship. I was going on commitments. Um, I had a sponsor. I had a home group. I was going on commitments. I was speaking at those commitments. And um, I was miserable. I was miserable. And, um, you know, there was, there was some people in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, that, that were telling me, you know, some things that, um, I believe just don't apply to the alcoholic, um, of my type. I'm that low bottom alcoholic that it talks about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, um, I can remember like when I got sober this time around, I got resentful of a lot of people in AA. Uh, but when I did some inventory at the truth, some inventory on it, the truth that was real, revealed to me was that like these people were like, they were doing the best with what they had and they were just, they were trying to help me. They were honestly just trying to help me. And here I was getting mad, you know, um, cause uh, around my area, I was hearing a lot of just don't drink and go to a meeting, shoot for midnight, put the plug in the jug and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be all right. Just don't drink. And uh, the only problem with that was that I just drank no matter what. You know, I just drank. You know, and it didn't really matter what the circumstance was. I could have been having, like, the best day in my life. You know what I mean? Like, I just got my job back, girls back. Like, everything's looking good. I got a fresh new pair of kicks on. Like, you know, what could be better? You know what I mean? Getting high. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, it's just that peculiar mental blank spot. Um when the book says suddenly the thought crosses my mind, it, it suddenly the thought crosses my mind. It doesn't call you up the day before and say, I'm going to ruin your life, call your sponsor. <laughs> suddenly happens. And there's been moments like that where, like, I was stone cold sober and I'm driving home and, like, everything's good. And, I'm, and, and like, I'm like, I'm going to sit down in my recliner. I'm going to watch the Patriots game. And, like, I'm going to make some nice food. And, uh, and I'm going to get high, you know. And I'm going to spend a, you know what I mean? But then I'll, you know. And just because it's going to be this one time, you know what I mean? So I can sit there and melt into my recliner. And, uh, but, uh, that never happened, man. And when the book says that we, uh, we're driven by, uh, delusion, um, you know, I understand what that means today. Um, a lot of people are telling me to think to drink through. And, um, I remember when, uh, I was on my, my, my first step with, with my sponsor and we're talking about this mental obsession. And, uh, it says that alcoholism centers in my mind. And this kid started to tell me that I couldn't use my thinking mind to solve my problem, which is my problem, right? This mental obsession that happens to me when I get sober. Um, but man, so like, you know, after struggling all these times in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous, I, uh, you know, I, I went into detox this time around and I get out of detox and, um, you know, I'm going to these meetings and I'm a month sober and again, I'm hanging on to my seat and I can't take it anymore. And like, miserable again sober you know and everyone's telling me it's going to get better you know but it wasn't it wasn't getting better it was getting worse honestly like here's what happened to me when i was sober those eight and a half months 
I hit a bottom in sobriety that was far worse than any bottom I hit while I was sober. I mean, while I was getting high, right? I hit a bottom in sobriety that was far worse than any bottom I hit while I was getting high. And I was honestly contemplating suicide. I couldn't take it anymore. This is like the point in time in my life where not only did I feel hopeless, but I felt helpless. Because everything that I was trying to do wasn't working. I was going to meetings every day. I was doing this and I was doing that. And, and, and I don't want you to misquote me as to say that those things are bad or anything like that because they're not. They're, 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 they're absolutely 100%, you know, like, something a necessity that's in my life but it's something that wasn't going to work for the long haul you know because when i looked at the first step of my sponsor it said that i've been placed beyond human aid and that there was no power on earth that was going to keep me away from a drink but um here i was a month sober again and i go to this meeting in dorchester and uh there was a kid my age you know um we were both 25 at the time and this kid was from hyde park and and, and you know he's getting his five-year medallion and uh and I'm all like, what's this shit about, you know? Like, who, who, who did, who's this kid think he is, you know? Um, and, and this kid's up there talking about God, spiritual principles, helping other alcoholics. And, like, he's going on and on and on. And I'm, like, sitting there listening to what this kid's saying. And I'm like, wow, this kid's, this kid's like, he's tearing it up up there. You know, I was getting pretty excited, too. And, uh, and, um... <coughs> But I, I don't know, you know, this kid was just carrying a message that I really hadn't heard in my area. Um, or maybe I did hear and just, um, I don't know, I could have been nodding off in the front row. I'm not sure, you know. Uh, but most of the meetings that I was going to, a lot of people were just, you know, um, giving a drunk a log or talking about their problem. And, uh, and they got up to the point where they got sober and they sat down. And, um, you know, I was coming to Alcoholics Anonymous to actually learn how to recover from alcoholism. And... Uh, which is why when I when I speak from the podium, I, 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 you know, present myself as a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of these people were telling me that they were going to be recovering for the rest of their life, and that really didn't appeal to me. Just didn't. Didn't appeal to me. I was going to be recovering for the rest of my life. Um, and when we opened up this big book, the, the book started using words as recovered, um, you know, free at last and reborn. You know, and I started using language like that, man, that really, like, attracted a guy like me. Like, yeah, you know, like, that's what I need. That's what I want. And um, so this kid's up there giving this talk, and, and he gets his five-year medallion. I'm like, I got to talk to this kid. I got to see what this kid's all about, you know. And, um, man, I don't know. I was just like, I don't know if any of you guys have ever come to that place where there's just, there's like, you, you've burnt every bridge and, like, the scorecard red zero. And, like, you got nowhere else to go. And you've just come to that point in your life where you just have no place else to go but God. You know? You got just no, it just, you know, even if I wanted to pick up, like, my phone and call somebody, I couldn't. There was no one left to call. You know? And uh, I asked this kid for help. And I was like, you know, when, when, when do we get into these steps? And he was like, when do you want to recover? And, uh... So I was like, I, I, I want to recover, like, right now, you know? Um, <laughs> well, not enough of your smart answers, all right? <laughs> and uh, he was like, well, we need to go at this with the desperation of a drowning man. You don't need to wait to feel better. You don't need to wait 90 days. You don't have to wait a year. Um, you don't have to wait any frame of time. And he took me to the place in the big book where it says, if you want what we have and you're willing to go to any lengths to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. And, uh, and I was like, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. And, uh, you know, it was two days later, we were in this kid's living room and, uh, this kid opened up the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and he started talking about the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, he started talking about Roland Hazard and Ebby Thatcher and Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob and how it all came about in the beginning. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it, you know, how like Alcoholics Anonymous was started and like, you know, we're sitting there and we're talking and, and, and like it like dawned on me. I'm like, you know, sitting there and I'm looking at this guy and like this is like me and him sitting right there. This is exactly how Alcoholics Anonymous started. You know, me and this kid sitting in that room. Went out when one alcoholic, you know, reached out to another alcoholic for no thought of reward, but just the sole purpose of recovery, you know. And uh, and, and, and like... This kid started talking about the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous in a way that I've, I've never, I've never heard before. 
I was just like, yep, first step, power, let's go. You know what I mean? Good. What's next? You know? And uh, this kid gave me 43 pages of, uh, of step one, you know, and uh, really backed me into a corner. And um, this kid started talking about the allergy of alcohol and what differentiates me from the normal person. And, like, I always use my girlfriend as an example because she's just like a normal average drinker and she's fine, she's cool, like she's never done drugs before. Like I don't get it, she gets it, but I don't get it, you know. And, and uh, something that happens to me that doesn't happen in the average person is that I experience an allergic reaction to alcohol. It doesn't happen in her, it happens in me, right? An allergic reaction is an abnormal reaction. And now some people are like allergic to bees and like I get stung by a bee, nothing happens. But I have like friends that get stung by bees. They like blow up. Then you go to the hospital, they're going to die. You know what I mean? Um, all sorts of crazy stuff. And, uh, and, uh, but I don't have that. You know what I mean? But I have it with alcohol. I have this, uh, this abnormal reaction called the phenomenon of craving. And this craving is only intensified and it's never satisfied, which is why I go to the many, any lengths to get it. Right. And he asked me to look back at my experience. And I had to go back into the drink, and I had to go back into the drug using. Was that my experience? Yes or no? There was no right or wrong. There was no right or wrong answer. Was this your experience? And I looked back at it, man, and it was. It was it absolutely was. Once I picked up a drink or a drug, all bets were off. I had great intentions of things that I was going to do, man. But man, I, I would just use against you know my own permission, like and, and like you know normal people just like don't drink and throw up and then like keep drinking and like wake up with a hangover and like feel horrible the next day and like we're going to do this again tomorrow it's going to be great you know what I mean like normal people don't do that like they they drink too much they feel sick and they throw up and like oh that, that's horrible you know what I mean not me I, and I don't know why you know but I would continually do it and do it and do it I mean like I, I would do like like you know crazy stuff you know I, I can remember one time when I was shooting cocaine I was just like set up in this bathroom right at the toilet because I knew I was going to puke and like you know who does that you know what I mean I'm just like alright getting ready like this you know what I mean and like and I puke like you know, and then I do it again, and then I do it again, and then I do it again, and then I'm laying on the floor, like, you know what I mean, like, <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's nothing I can do to stop it, you know what I mean, like, average people don't do, they don't get high like that, but this is this phenomenon of craving, that, like, I can't stop, you know, and, like, I understand that, you know, and I, and I had to concede to my animal self that I, I you know, that was me, that was me, and I, I, I had to kill that delusion that I had. That I could, that I could, you know, use in safety. This kid started talking about this mental obsession, right? And, uh, you know, then I had to go into like different areas in my life where I was sober and I picked up a drink. And, and, and like, you know, this, this kid just had me. You know what I mean? And, and he started talking about this peculiar mental blank spot. And like, there was so many times, so many reasons I had like, so many good reasons to stay sober, but I absolutely couldn't. Or like, so many times where I'd use against my own permission. And there were so many times where I just swore alcohol and drugs off for the rest of my life, and I wasn't going to do it ever again. And, like, things were going good at some point in time. And then, bam, you know, I was drunk or high again. I was wondering how it happened. And it got me every single time. Like, the obsession would be on me so hard, you know, so hard. And, and it, man, it was just like there was nothing I could do on my own power to not, you know, it, it, it was crazy, you know, like the most insane thing that any of us will ever do, we do from a state of consciousness called sobriety, and that's pick up the first drink. And there's nothing I can do on my own power to not do what I didn't want to do, right? This kid just started backing to me into a corner in this first step, because like he really started talking to me about like, you know, what it was to be, to be powerless, you know? Um, you know, basically what happened is, man, I, I lose the ability of power, choice, and control, not only in the body, but in the mind. You know, um, I, I, I tell people, like I, I hear people often from the podium say, you know, they, they have a choice today and they choose not to drink. Um, that implies self-reliance. And, and if I think that I'm making a choice not to drink, to, you know, not to drink today, I'm self-reliant. And if I'm self-reliant, I'm experiencing a first step problem. The only choice that a guy like me can make is whether I'm going to seek a conscious contact with a power greater than me that's going to prevent me from picking up a drink. And that's it. And from that decision, all, all, all else things stem in my life. You know, that's the choice that I make, you know, because when I looked at this first step, I saw that I've been placed beyond human aid. I mean, I mean, you just think about it. Like so many times I've been sober and like you could have put like everything like, you know, he was talking about like how like, 
my uh, my human resources have failed me, you know, and like, and like I was unable to stay sober for the love of my girlfriend. I was unable to stay sober for my family. I was unable to stay sober for my freedom. Uh, going to meetings every day, job, no job, money, no money, like wh whatever the circumstance was. And the funny thing about it is, like, I could have been sober, and you could have put all all that stuff like right up on the counter, like you know what I mean. You're gonna lose this. You're gonna lose this. You're gonna lose your freedom, your family, your place to live, your girlfriend, your job. It's all gonna go. And for some reason, every time it was pushed aside, and the drink won. And the drink won. Every time. That's the mental obsession. You know? For some reason. And sometimes they would crowd into my mind. You know, like, she's going to leave this time. Or I'm going to get fired. Or I'm not going to have a place to sleep. You know, or I'm going to go back to jail. Or this time, I might die. But for some reason, it would all just be pushed aside. And this drink would win every single time and there was nothing I could do to stop it and I didn't want these things to happen in my life and that was the mental obsession and this kid started talking about how this you know this problem right here resides in my mind and I can't use my thinking mind to solve my problem he said we need to overcome the spiritual malady and then we'll straighten out mentally and physically right and there was a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous that were like no you should like get sober first like physically and then you'll clear up mentally and like, and then you can work on the spiritual aspect of it. The only problem was like, I when I got sober, like you thought I was bad when I was getting high. You should have seen me sober in early recovery. I was nuttier than squirrel shit. Like, I was. I, I remember being eight and a half months sober, and, and there's a, there's a place in the book where it says, um, it engulfs all whose lives touch to suffer, right? And I'm eight and a half months sober, suffering from untreated alcoholism and drug addiction, going to meetings every day, had a sponsor, going on commitments, doing all these things. Um, I had no idea. I thought I was doing the deal. Um, but there's a recovery process here in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's called the 12 Steps. They outline a plan of recovery for you to get well. And um, just like if you were diagnosed with cancer, right, um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty confident that if the doctor would say to you, like, listen, you're dying from a progressive fatal illness. And, like, if you don't do A, B, and C, and he outlines a plan of recovery, you need chemotherapy, you need radiation, you need to take this medication, right away, don't wait, or well, there's a chance you're going to die, right? And, 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 that's, and that's the deal, and, and that's the deal that my sponsor was trying to tell me. He's like, listen, you know what I mean? You're dying from a progressive fatal illness. There is a recovery process. It's called the 12 steps. There's, we outline a plan of recovery for you. It's in our basic text. It's called the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you follow directions in that book, you will get well, and you can live a life that's really cool. And it's funny, man. Like, if you walk into a hospice today, and there was like 50 people that were terminally ill, and, uh, and, 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 you, and you talk to these people, and you told them that, like, Hey, look, we, we, we found we found a way that you, you don't have to die. You don't have to die. Um, it's a it's a spiritual solution. There's four million people that are doing it right now, and 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 they're all getting well. Um, all you have to do is follow me. I guarantee everybody in that room, you know, would, would, they they would they would follow the guy's instructions. But for some reason, here in Alcoholics Anonymous, man, you know. We, we lay out this, this spiritual tools at someone's feet. Most of the time, they just kick it away. And it's almost like this this alcoholism has a life of its own, man. You know? Um, but regardless, me and this kid start going through the steps. And, and these kids explain to me the first step. And he's talking about this spiritual malady, this deep sense of separation that I have from God, from you, from my family, and from everyone else in this world. And, and I, I, man, I identified with that. You know what I mean? Because I felt that way. I walk into a room full of 100 people and felt absolutely alone, right? Restless, irritable, discontent, always unease, you know, full of anxiety, full of fear, couldn't take it. Um, and uh, this kid hit me with a solution in the second step. Like, this kid just backs me into a corner. You know what I mean? And he goes over all these things, and he's like, you've been placed beyond human aid, you know what I mean? There's nothing you can do on your own power to not drink. You know, we looked at every, like, single scenario possible. I'm sitting there, and, like, this kid talks, starts talking about God as a solution. And he's like, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, like, you know, I don't know if I believe in God, but if I don't believe in God, it looks like I'm in pretty deep shit, you know, because I felt, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, like, weighing all my options here, and I'm like, this doesn't look too good, you know? But at that point in time, like, when that kid backed me into that corner and he was talking about this stuff, I was like, you know, I, I, I'm in. I'm in. 
you know, and he was like, listen, you don't even have to say that you believe, okay? All you have to do is be willing. And the big book makes this beautiful promise, and it says all you need to do is be willing to believe that there's some sort of power out there greater than you, and you can commence to get great results, however inadequate, right, your conception of this power is. First step, problem. Second step, solution. Third step, I make a decision to do something about it, right? And I make this contract with God, you know what I mean, to, to, to set out and finish this work. But, um, you know, there was something about this third step, man, that just, like, I love, you know what I mean? It, it's just something that touches me every single time that I read it. And uh, it talks about um, the actor trying to run the whole show. And, and if that's not me, I, I don't know who I am. But um, it says we need to quit playing God. It didn't work, right? And, 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 and that was me in my life, you know? I was trying to arrange life to suit me. And I needed you to act a certain way in order for me to be okay. And, and I was very much the actor trying to run the whole show because I wanted my family to act a certain way. I wanted my girlfriend to act a certain way. I wanted my boss to act a certain way. I wanted my coworkers to act a certain way. I wanted you to act a certain way. And if you didn't, I was going to get pissed. You know, and I had a script for every one of my life. The only problem was I didn't mail it out to you so you didn't get it. Right, but when you didn't live up to my expectations, I wanted to call cut and redirect, you know. But when I started doing inventory, I found that my problems were of my own making. And that's a damn good thing that my problems are of my own making. Because if my problems were of your making, I would need you to change in order for me to get old, to get well, right. And what's the chances of that happen? Slim to none, right. But this kid starts talking about how, like, this takes the drink right out of the equation and starts talking about selfishness and self-centeredness and my life run on self-will. I'm like, well, what is this kid talking about right now? <laughs> like, you know, I want to stop drinking. This kid's talking about me being selfish. Like, you know, I thought he was being smart again. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't really understand the connection between my selfishness and my alcoholism. But he put it to me like this. When I'm living my life run on self-will, right, what happens? I'm usually in collision with you. And if I'm in collision with you, right, I get resentful. And when I get resentful, I get angry and I get pissed off. And when I get angry and I get pissed off, I'm not in fit spiritual condition. And if I'm not in fit spiritual condition, I get blocked. And the only thing that will prevent me from picking up a drink, which is God, right? And I heard a guy once say, if you want to measure your distance from God, measure your distance from your fellows, right? Because God's in each and every one of us, right? And if I'm separated from, from you, I'm separated from the God in you. And ultimately, I'm separated from God, you know? And I get that today. I understand that. And, um, you know, my first step experience was so profound, you know, that, that it allowed me to do the rest of this work, man. And I, I made that an inventory, and uh, something started to happen. Something, you know, something just started to click, and I, and, I, and I don't know what it was, but I started to feel something, something that was really overwhelming, you know, and, um, you know, I just knew that my life was changing, and I took this inventory, like, my whole life, and, and there was some, there was, there was, man, there was a lot of pain in my life, and, uh, you know, one of the truths that was revealed to me in my fourth and fifth step, man, is that, like, I accused all of you, my family, and everyone else in this world, for being human and falling short. I accused you all of being human beings and falling short. And man, we went through that list, you know. And it wasn't every time that I set the ball rolling, but nine times out of ten, yeah. And uh, man, I, I, I got it, man. It just like leveled me. It, it leveled me. It was like, you know, something like I fall short all the time. Like I'm a vicious retard. I have a down payment on being a Hall of Fame retard. You know what I mean? For anyone who knows me really well knows that. You know what I mean? Like, I fall short, you know? Um, and, and, like, I get that. Like, why is it okay for me to fall short, but it's not okay for you to fall short? And when I fall short, I want to be forgiven right away. But if you fall short, I'm not going to forgive you. In fact, I might have to do something about that, you know? <laughs> and, 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 like, you know, I, I just – and that's when I started to experience this shift, that's why I started to, 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 to experience this shift, my attitude towards you, towards my family, towards my parents, you know what I mean, towards everyone else, you know. That's when I started to experience this shift, man. I was just like, you know something, it's just like I fall short and you fall short. Like I was getting resentful because this person lied to me, but like I lied to like 500 different people. And I'm like, it's okay if I do it, but it's not okay if she does it, you know. And for the first time in my life moving forward, like, you know, 
um, when, when I saw people like, you know, falling short, instead of like me, you know, what I usually do is kick them while they're down, um, I put my hand out there and started to help them. Instead of making bad situations worse, you know, I started bringing peace to situations, you know, and, uh, man, it, it was, it was amazing, you know, that, uh, that fourth and fifth step for me was, was something that was vital. And the book uses that word vital. And the word vital means in order to sustain life. Um, because that was the problem. I needed to find some sort of power by which I could live. Like lack of power was my dilemma. That was my problem, lack of power, right? When I was sober, for some reason, that wasn't my problem. Lack of power to pick this alcohol up was my problem. That was my dilemma. I needed to find a power by which I could live. And it had to be a power greater than myself. <coughs> The only thing is, I don't need to go anywhere to find that power because he's closer to me than breathing. And the book says, the great reality is deep down within us, right? We just need to clear away what's in the way. And in the fourth step, it says that we need to face and be rid of the things that are blocking us from this power, right? And the book talks about calamity, right? I have all sorts of calamity in my life. I don't know if anyone's got any calamity, but sometimes I like calamity too. You know, sometimes I mistake excitement for calamity. Um, and then there's pomp, you know? And pomp is just like, you know, selfish to the core, consumed only with me, what I want and what I need, you know, and then worship of other things. And I know all of us have it, man. You know, there's so many, there's so many things in my life in the past that I put before God, you know. And then there was all these resentments and these fears and this like, you know, this personal relationship problems that I was having, you know. I needed to clear all that away. I didn't need to acquire anything. I thought when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, like I needed a girlfriend, a job, and a haircut. Like, and I used to call it the AA hat trick. You know what I mean? Like, like I thought it was a funny guy. You know what I mean? And uh, and the funny thing about it is I'd get all these things back in my life and I'd lose them just like that. You know? And, and I came to realize that I didn't need to acquire anything. Right? A guy once told me that spiritual growth always comes from subtraction, never, never addition. Right? And, uh, you know, it's funny, like, when I'm living, like, this nice, simple life, you know, and I'm not all consumed about, like, me, and, and I'm being of service to others, it's just, like, it's unbelievable the way I feel, you know? And looking at these 12 steps, I thought they were going to be a burden for me. And uh, I can tell you right now that they weren't. And I took action a set of principles that I didn't believe in, and I got results that I can't deny, Right? And I looked at these steps and I came to this work because I was feeling a lot of pain and I didn't know if they're going to work. I didn't even know if I believe that they're going to work. And, and, and I, mean, I took action, a set of principles that, that I didn't believe in. And I got results that I couldn't deny. Something amazing started to take place. And, you know, today I'll tell you it was the hand of God, you know, and he was working through my sponsor to get me. And, um, you know, four and five was all about me. Six and seven was about getting connected with God. And eight and nine was about getting connected with you, you know, and, and it was beautiful. Um, you know, I, I think six and seven is, is overlooked quite a few times. But, you know, when we look at step six and seven, the essence is a six, uh, step six and seven is that like, you know, I, I, you know, I can see to my innermost self that like I can't remedy all this unmanageability that I have on my own or I can't remedy these defects of character that I have on my own. You know what I mean? And in seven, I rely upon the power of God. You know, not me. I rely upon the power of God to remove these things, you know. And that's that's what that was about, man. I understood that, man. I get that now, you know. And, like, when I looked at that, all that, that second part of the first step, the unmanageability, I just think, you know, if I get my ducks in a row, I'm going to be good. You know what I mean? Like, I got a job. I'm paying the bills on time. I got a girlfriend. Isn't everything great? No, I'm stealing from my job. You know what I mean? Like, my girlfriend hates me. Um, you know, like, everything. Like, I don't know if you guys ever, like, this this page 52 in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It talks about these bedevilments. Like we were having trouble with personal relationships. We were prey to misery and depression. Uh, we were unhappy. We were full of fear. We had a feeling of worthlessness and uselessness. And uh, we were, uh, you know, we were unemployable. I was uninterviewable at the time. And uh, we were of no use to other people. And that was me, sober. That was me, sober. You know, and, and, and you know, this this unmanageability that the book was talking about was not an external condition. It was an internal condition because there was so many times in my life where I had good things and inside I wanted to die, right? I don't measure my success by what, what, by what I have, you know, material things. I measure my success by how I feel, you know, and uh, 
I uh, I made some some deep rooted resentments um, that uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I remember going out these resentment. I mean, uh, these these amends, and, and like I thought it was like all about me getting free. Uh, but I started to realize that um, you know it wasn't all about me and, and, and making these amends. I was allowing all these people that I harmed, um, allowing them to be able to heal, and I was getting reconnected with you. And um, I remember when like the the big book is talking about like we don't dodge our creditors, and I'm like looking at him. I'm like, listen, listen, kid. <laughs> I, I don't want to give them my money. And he was like, Chris, they don't want your money. They want their money. You know, it was never my money to begin with. You know what I mean? I took it from them, you know? And like now I don't want to give them my money. You know what I mean? Um, it never was my money. And um, I was able to go back and, and I was I was able to pay the thousands and thousands of dollars that I had in debt. And um, there was some deep rooted resentments I had. Um, and... Uh, I mean, I, w- I was able to make some of those, and, and I can I can tell you this right now. One of the most deep rooted deep rooted resentments that I did have with this guy, um, I did not want to make an amends to him. I, I I wanted to hurt. Like I had plans for this guy, and uh, you know, I remember my sponsor was like, you know, we we need we need to make this amends. We need to make this amends. And uh, you know, the big book says sometimes we take the bit on the teeth, and I took the bit on the teeth. And I uh, I made this amends, and, and it turned out this guy was sober and alcoholics anonymous now, and uh, I was working the steps, and uh, I was having all sorts of problems at this time with meditation, and uh, this guy came to like one of my best friends and started calling me like five o'clock in the morning. We were on our way to work, and like he was he started helping me with meditation, you know, and uh, that's something that's just like unbelievable. And uh, another thing that's like um that's happened to me right now is like I have some outstanding amends for some people that I can't find and um this guy asked me to speak at this meeting and um I go to this meeting and um I see this kid and and, and I, I know I recognize him and uh <clears throat> and I'm thinking to myself yeah I don't know if that's him it might be him I think it's him I was like let me call my buddy I was like hey you know you remember his cousin that kid's cousin I was like you still have his number I call him up and see who see if he was just at this meeting and uh, it turned out it was. This this kid was a kid from Charlestown. And uh, I don't know if you guys know about, like, Charlestown at all or, like, you've seen the town, you know. But, like, they're not always all that pleasant over there. Uh, <clears throat> but um, this kid almost stabbed me to death and robbed me one night because uh, I was selling drugs. And, uh, you know, and there was a lot of retaliation on my end for him and his cousin. And a lot of bad things took place. And, 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 a, and a lot of people ended up getting hurt. And um, here I am, seven, eight years later, and uh, we're, we're in a circle, and, and we're saying the Lord's Prayer together, and the kid's right next to me. Uh, he's about two people away from me, or actually, I think he was holding my girlfriend's hands when we were circled up. And uh, and I didn't I didn't know for a fact it was him or not, and I, was gonna, I wasn't going to make the approach, like, hey, you're the kid who stabbed me, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and then something jump off in the meeting, and... Um, but uh, the, the funny thing about it was that I was I was scheduled to speak at that meeting and I was late. I was was in traffic for it was one of those days it was like porn and like I couldn't get to the meeting on time and they just went ahead with it and uh and like this kid was all the way in the back and that's the only place I could find a seat and and, and like that's where I saw this kid and I probably would have never saw him if I wasn't late and uh, now I'm scheduled to come back there a month later and uh you know it's just I know it's time you know and like. My ego tells me, like, I can't make an amends to this kid. Like, I need to do something about it. You know, I heard this definition one time of an ego. It was a mind-made false sense of self. And I had this ego about myself where, like, you know, I- I'm this, like, city kid with street morals. And, like, if someone does that to me, regardless of the situation, I don't forgive them. You know, and I have to do something about them because, I- honestly, like, I'm scared to tell people that I made an amends to some kid who's, too- to some kid who's you know, stabbed me and robbed me. You know what I mean? Even though, like, some of the things that I did with him were just as equally as bad, you know? And, um, but, like, I, I, my sense of self is not derived externally anymore. It comes from within, you know? And, uh, you know, I know I need to make this amends. And, 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 and man, it's, it's, you know, I'm taking a course of action right now that's going to allow me to, me and this kid to sit down and, and just to imagine that, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's unreal, these amends, you know? And all I know is that real ugly part of my life started to heal. 
you know, when I started going out and making all these amends. And, uh, I mean, this kid started getting in with the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, you know, and uh, it's, you know, it, it's amazing. You know, I, I'm real big on inventory. I love inventory, you know. Um, inventory, you know, a lot, a lot of people get mixed up. You know, my 11th step is my prayer and meditation in the morning and my nightly review at night. My 10th step is in my, you know, nightly review. That's the second part of my 11th step. You know, if there's, if there's time throughout the course of the day that I need to take inventory, I have a few guys that I can call in the middle of the day and say, hey, listen, I got an immediately. You know what I mean? If someone's going to get hurt, we got to talk. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a certain group of guys that I hang around with. We do a steal on steal um, at my house, and we, like, we, we work on, like, four different areas of our life. Um, and we meet once a month, and, and uh, you know, these guys, my sponsor, and a few other guys, uh, you know, someone that I can call, you know, during the course of my day. But these 10-step practices that I have when I, when, I, when I leave my house in the morning, because there's so many times where, like, you know, I'll pray and meditate, and, like, get all hooked up and, like, feel like, you know, like, you know, everything is going to be great. And then my hand hits the door and then it's on, you know, and then I'm out there, you know, and I have all these 10-step practices that I can work with. Ask, turn, cease fighting, pause when agitated, right? I constantly have to tell myself, quit, Chris, quit playing God, you know, stop trying to control everyone, you know what I mean? Because, like, I, I, I am, you know what I mean? I, I'm always up on my throne, like, and getting pissed off because, like, you're not acting the way I want you to act. You know what I mean? And what happens? I get pissed off and I stay sore and that's the father, that's the, that's the best I get. That's it. You know? But now I have these tools where I can get free of that. You know? And um, I can tell you right now, working with uh, Step 11 has, has been probably one of the most amazing things in my life. Like, working with meditation was not easy at first. I was having a lot of problems with it because when it gets quiet in here, it gets really loud in there, out there. Um, and I have a legion of, like, animals that just, they go at it up there, you know. And, and I can remember, like, being, like, first sober, um, like, there would be times where, like, I would go to sleep at night. And it's like, I'm exhausted, I'm going to bed. And it's like, they're still going at it up there, right? And I toss and turn all night and I wake up the next day and I'm like, wow, I didn't sleep real well. It's because they were going at it, right? All these, like, old resentments that I had or these new resentments that I had or these fears that are going on. And, like, I got all these different characters up in my mind, and I got all these people that I'm – and this, they're having conversations. They're going at it. You know what I mean? And they keep me up at night, right? And, and, and like, I, I don't know if any of you guys can identify, like, waking up the next morning and be like, whoa, I tossed and turned all night, and, like, your mind was racing. That was them. That was them, you know? And, uh, you know, being able to, like, you know, work with these tools and work with these disciplines of 10, 11, and 12 and get free of that. And, and, and work with meditation, right? Meditation, I quiet my mind so when the answers do come, I hear them, you know? I've had a lot of cool things come out of meditation. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the most important things that I will talk to you tonight about is working with other alcoholics. Something from the very first time I met with my sponsor, he smashed into my head that it wasn't about me. It was about me getting well and going out to be of service to other alcoholics and other people in my family and, and, and you. And um, he closed that book and he was like, Chris, he's like, you need to go out and you need to start helping other alcoholics or your life depends on it, you know. And he talked about this insurance policy in the big book where it says, you know, practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking more than intensive work and other alcoholic. And it works when all activities fail and it was going to be the bright spot of my life. And, like, I thought it was going to be an inconvenience. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? And, like, to be quite honest, I was scared. I'm like, Sean, you know, I don't know like you know and I can't say it like you say it. And, like, honestly, like, I got to get my life together here. Like, my father just died. I had custody of my 12-year-old brother um, because his mother was in treatment and my father just passed away. I, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, I got a suspended sentence at South Bay Prison. I'm on probation. Um, I, like my, me and my father, this lobster company in Boston. I'm trying to keep it alive. Me and my sister trying to pay the mortgage at his house. And like, I'm like Sean. You know, honestly, I got to get my life in order here, pal. You know, I'm gonna do me, and, and then I'll, 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 you know, I'll help someone along the way. And he was like, No, listen, Chris, you don't understand. You need to help other people, and your life will get in order. And uh. You know, I remember the promise in the third step prayer. It says, take away my difficulties 
in victory over them are going to bear witness to those I would help. Um, I, I started going out and, and I started helping other people. And, and at first, like, I was really gun ho about this work. I mean, I, I mean, I was a kid that was literally at the bottom of the barrel. And all of a sudden, like, I'm like this, like, secret agent of God. Like, I, I was like, I'm an undercover angel now. You know what I mean? But I was just like, I, I, <laughs> I was going to this meeting in South Boston called the Looney Noonie, right? And there was a lot of homeless guys coming in off the street, and they're going to this meeting. And, like, I'm raising my hand, and I'm, like, talking about the big book and spiritual principles. And everyone's looking at me, like, what the hell's wrong with this kid? And, um, and like, after the meeting, like, I, I, I was getting these, like, the, these alcoholics, these homeless guys. I'm like, hey, you want to go, go grab a coffee? Want to go for a ride? And they're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, like, we passed three Dunkin' Donuts. And they're like, hey, where are we going? And I'm like, you want a fucking detox, pal? You know? And, uh, and, uh. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't I, I honestly wouldn't suggest doing that um, it only worked like you know one times out of ten or a couple or something like that uh, bring someone with you though um, but like I, I and like this guy Davis like Chris you know it's a program of attraction not of abduction like you know, and like I'm like calling my like, buddy up who's just going through the steps I'm like let's get a let's get a U-Haul van and go down to the commons kid and just like you know start snatching drunks up and taking them a detox and like you know uh, but um, I was two and a half months sober and I started raising my hand and I started sharing my experience with this work and um, in my area Honestly, guys, I was catching a lot of heat from some people, and I started sponsoring guys with two and a half months sober, and there was people in my area that told me that I can't do it, I shouldn't do it, and that I was going to kill alcoholics doing it, that I had nothing to offer, and I needed to wait a year or more where I could sponsor people, and I went back to, I, you know, I was going back to my to my sponsor, and, 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 I, and I was, you know, like, I, I didn't feel good about it, and, and he was like, Chris, he's like, Jesus Christ carried a message of love, and they crucified him. And he took me to the to the different places in the literature where it talks about in the history about how like people in Alcoholics Anonymous in the beginning days when the success rate was over ninety percent that like they didn't have this book and they didn't have these meetings they had this process of recovery they had this solution and they carried it and what they did is they sought out other alcoholics I don't wait for people to ask me for help I seek them out right and and they take them through these twelve steps and they get well. And if they want to stay sober, they need to go out and find other alcoholics, right? Just the way Roland Hazard sought out Ebby Thatcher, and Ebby Thatcher sought out Bill Wilson, and Bill Wilson sought out Dr. Bob, right? I seek these people out. When I see people at a meeting, they raise their hand, and they say they're hurt, and I go and talk to them after the meeting, and I give them my number, and I get theirs, right? And I don't just sit there and say, you know, if you need help, come and ask me, and then walk out the door and leave. Um, and, 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 and this kid was bringing me to, like, you know, the certain parts of the literature where it talked about how, like, these people were getting sober and, and going through the steps immediately and, and fast and effectively. And as soon as they were done, they were sponsoring guys within a week, two weeks, you know. He said, Chris, honestly, you're a late bloomer. You're two and a half months sober and you're not sponsoring anyone, you know. And, like, I started sponsoring guys and I started taking them through this process. And uh, this miracle happens. This, this unbelievable miracle for a guy like me. Um, the most destructive force in my life, my obsession to drink and to use drugs, was taken away. Um, and, uh, man, my, my life is, you know, I, I'm not going to say, like, my life is, like, unbelievable. It is unbelievable considering, like, where, where I've come from and, like, what's happened through the course of my life. Um, but, like, I've sponsored guys who know more about life than I do, have been married, have run their own businesses, um, who are older than me, who have more time than me. Um, I'm actually sponsoring a guy who's a minister right now um, who's incapable of staying sober. And, um, and, and who would have thought, you know what I mean, that, the, uh, that, that I would be sponsoring a guy like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've taken him through this process and, 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 and just watch people just like come to life and watch them get reconnected with their families and, and and just unbelievable stuff happen. It's just like sit back and watch the hand of God, you know, do His work. It's it's unreal. It really is, you know. And I, and I can't say, you know, enough about it. Working with other alcoholics, and it's not just with you know with other alcoholics. It's 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 you know the people in my home, my relationships, you know, at work. You know, this is twenty four seven. I do these things. You know, and so absolutely, I fall short. 
you know. Sometimes, I, I, you know, I, I sit there and pray and meditate and get all hooked up and leave my house and do something shady, you know what I mean? And I remember a, a guy once said, you know, Chris, welcome to the human race. Welcome to the human race, you know, we fall short. And, uh, man, I, I, I just, like, I don't know, I have such a passion for Alcoholics Anonymous. It, it's it's amazing. It saved my life. And, uh, you know, like, I, I met this, like, this, this unbelievable girl for the first time in relation, you know, first time in my life, I have a healthy relationship. Um, I have this, this, I have this incredible job. Like, you know, uh, I manage the seafood company in Boston. Like I have the keys to the building and I have like a code for the security system. Um, I think it's, I think it's hilarious. You know what I mean? Cause I used to like, in the end, like I was doing B and E's and like, you know, robbing small businesses, like, you know, we trust you so much, you know, you're so, they, they gave me a raise without me even asking, you know what I mean, and, and, uh, and they gave me the keys to the building, and like, you know, <laughs> I think it's hilarious, you know, and, uh, you know, like, me and my girlfriend just bought a house, you know what I mean, um, and, my little brother, like, looks up to me and, and wants to be like me. Um, you know, people come to me for help. Um, and, you know, it, it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with God. You know what I mean? I'm just a vessel. God works through me. I let him demonstrate through me what he can do. You know, um, it, it's not really about what I say up here at this podium, guys. It's about what I did before I came here, what I intend to do, when I leave here. I can get up here and I can say all sorts of great stuff and quote the big book and and yada 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 and give you a great song and dance but that's not what this is about my uh my grand sponsor told me from from the beginning chris carry this message and if necessary use your words um obviously you know this moment right here and right now is is, is one of those times where i have to use my words um but my actions will speak loud and clear you know um i know one thing guys i know i have a disease that's so much more powerful than i am uh, but today I have a God in my life that's so much more powerful than my disease. Um, and, and everything that I was looking for in drugs and alcohol, I found here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I, I look at my sponsor, and to me, he's a guy. He's a very simple guy, lives a very simple life, and he doesn't have much. But to me, he's the richest guy in this world because the peace and content and serenity that this guy has is unreal. You know, it's unbelievable, and that's what I want, and that's what I strive for. And when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know, like, you're new, and you're like, this is like the last house on the block. For some of us in Alcoholics Anonymous, God is the last house on the block, you know. And the book says, uh, there is one who has all power, may you find him now, you know. Not next Thursday, not in a month, you know. You don't have to wait to feel better. You can feel better now, you know. You, you don't have to wait 60 days or 90 days or a year, you know. There's nothing to figure out. It's all been figured out for us when, when Bill Wilson met Dr. Bob. And, and, and all you have to do if you're new in this room is you just need to find someone who has experience with this work, right, and let them walk you through this process, and that's it. And you can have this, like, the same result that everyone else in Alcoholics Anonymous gets is this spiritual awakening. And if that term really throws you off, there's a great explanation in the back of the book in Appendix 2. And it talks about how, you know, we have this, for most of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, have this profound personality change. And that's what took place in me. I had extreme profound personality change in my whole attitude toward God, towards, towards you, and towards everything else in this life have changed. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.